Nintendo puts out a new console, but will they actually make enough for, so that people can buy it for once? Thanks for joining us. I'm Randall Bennett. Nintendo's newest console, the DSi, hits store shelves last Sunday, and eager buyers are able to pick it up for a little bit over 150 bucks. Uh, DSi doesn't change that much from the previous DS, except for the addition of a camera, as well as an app store, which some people think could be a big change for Nintendo. But is this actually an incremental shift or something more significant? Let's talk to two writers who know what they're talking about with games. Chris Grant from Joystick. Chris, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Randall. Also, we have Russ Frushstick from UGO.com. Russ, thanks for joining us as well. No problem. Thanks, Randall. So, Chris, I mean, you guys cover this stuff all the time. To me, it seems more of like no DS owner is going to want to upgrade to the DSi just because it's so, such a little change. And maybe, you know, it's, it might be a little bit of an extra bonus to have that camera for people who are looking to pick up a DS. Do you think that this really strengthens its position in the marketplace, or do you think this is more of just frills? Uh, I'm going to go with more frills. Uh, Nintendo at GDC gave us the first um, clue as to the sorts of things we could expect from the new functionality, but I don't think it's enough to encourage existing DS owners to upgrade. And I think it's not even enough to ask new owners to, to spend an extra $40 on uh, above the price of the DS Lite. There's going to be two DSs on the market. Um, they've got the App Store, uh, the DSi Wear, showing off a couple games, but competing against a service like, you know, Apple's um, yeah, iPhone see. Marketplace, not even close. And, um, and the cameras, I mean, there's a couple little gimmicks uh, right now, but it's not enough to, I think, encourage people to upgrade uh, or spend the extra $40. Russ, I mean, this is something that Nintendo, Nintendo's been pretty good at console launches, you know, with a few notable exceptions, of course, being Virtual Boy, the other portable that didn't really catch on. Do you think that this is something that, you know, is going to stick around in the marketplace, or do you think people are going to see through the hype? Well, I mean, Nintendo's not going to ignore it in three months like the Virtual Boy. Uh, you know, the DSi is here to stay. I think what's the different, differentiating factor here is really the quality of the apps. If they really turn it up and make the, the software that will be available on their app store viable, you know, well, worthwhile, worth your money, worth your DS points, what have you, then the product becomes <laughs> worth, you know, upgrading for. Right now, there's five games. Some of them are okay, but nothing's really again, worth investing. That may change over time. You get better developers in there, but right now it's you know not really there yet. So Chris, uh, one thing I've been kind of wondering about this app store that I haven't really got a clear answer on is that are regular people able to sign up a, a la the iTunes model and develop their own applications? Or is this still publishers that are approved by Nintendo who have previous publishing experience, kind of like friends? Yeah, it's still an approval process. I mean, Apple does have an approval process also, but it's obviously a lot more lenient. Um, so, yeah, it's not a totally wide open store the way the Apple Store is. Uh, I'm not sure about the um, their their fee sharing deals yeah. or how that works. You know, Apple's 70% to the developer, 30% to Apple, and Apple takes care of everything, all hosting. So I'm not really sure about those details. It's something that Nintendo isn't really eager to make public. But the bigger question... Um, for a lot of people is, are we going to see a lot of development here? Um, what are the games going to cost? I mean, there's some kind of clumsy aspects to it, like uh, you can use Nintendo points, but those Nintendo points, if you use them and activate them on your DSi, then they're locked to that DSi. That's you so can't weird. go buy virtual console games on your Wii, even yeah. though they changed the name from Wii points to Nintendo points before the DSi launch, but those points aren't but they don't actually carry usable over. on both platforms, right? Yes. So it's kind of a clumsy thing. Are people really going to go out and buy these DSi points just for their DSi and not expect to use any of that money on their Wii? Um, really clumsy, and it kind of shows, I think, Nintendo's lack of, uh, not only is it a lack of kind of planning, but maybe that's also a lack of infrastructure. Um, it just doesn't seem anywhere, I mean, close to being as polished yeah. uh, of a product as the iPhone. If I look at my girlfriend, for example, she um, had DS, and she would play it at home. She was really usually recalcitrant to bring it around um, it's just one more thing in her purse. Now that she's got an iPhone, she's buying games on the App Store all the time. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's the kind of audience that they want, but I don't think they're going to get it. I think it's funny. Uh, Nintendo hasn't really figured out exactly what it means to be a true online company. If you look at things like friend codes, it's just a nightmare. If you look at the Xbox, super easy to find your friends online, 
add them and play with them. But if you try to do the same thing on the Wii, it's a 16 character code for each game. It's just really clumsy. And I think this speaks more to Nintendo's inexperience in the online arena and their failure to kind of get the picture. Um, let's talk about a different online aspect. Back a couple weeks ago at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, uh, there was an application and service revealed called Online. The basic premise is instead of having to upgrade your computer hardware every time you need to play a new game, uh, Online service would actually have super fast, super efficient machines at their location, then they would transmit compressed video over the internet to you, and then you would actually be able to play the game as if you were at their servers. Now, it's kind of an interesting concept, and of course it rings of cloud computing and all those other buzzwords that are hot right now, but one of the big concerns, at least for me, is it sounds a lot like you're going to have a lot of lag, and this doesn't really seem like it's going to work at scale. Now, Russ, you had a chance to play with this at GDC. What are your impressions? Do you think this is vaporware, or do you think this is something that could really happen and change gaming? Uh, well, you know, when I tried it at GDC, I, I thought it was incredible if it's not a scam. Like, if there's not <laughs> an Alienware sitting under the, uh, under, under the desk. Yeah. Like, it worked, like, I was playing Mirror's Edge, a pretty high-end, uh, graphically intensive game. There was the slightest bit of lag, like, you could very barely sense it, but it really, like, didn't hinder gameplay. Um, it was inc like it worked incredibly, and it was coming in this you know the set top box is the size of uh, you know like that big. It's tiny. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, it's you know this ideal situation where you've got God knows what sort of connections going to the home server. Yeah. And yeah. will people be be able to support this sort of thing? It's you know in their home. Now they're talking about opening beta in the summer, so potentially that you'll see if this does actually work at home, but. You know, it brings up a lot of issues apart from the connection speed. You know, uh, cable companies are starting to charge for yeah. bandwidth. Those bandwidth caps are going to start so, getting close to the limit if more services like this come out for sure. Um, yeah. Chris, do you think this is something that's going to happen? Or, I mean, one of my big concerns, obviously, like right now I'm in a place where there's not a lot of upload speed. And, um, you know, I have a lot of download speed, but I'm pretty remote. Like I'm living in North Carolina for a couple months. And I've, I hear that their servers are actually incidentally around me. But for someone who lives further away from these servers, you know, these ping times are going to become a real issue. Do you think this is something that they can deal with? Or what do you think of this situation? So um, I share Russ's skepticism in that, you know, if this works, it's pretty incredible. If this works, it's extremely disruptive, right? It's a game changer for the entire PC gaming industry. Um, but on the other hand, you know, who knows? And exactly those questions, I had a chance to sit down with the um, founder, Steve Perlman, for about an hour and kind of just pepper him with these questions. And he really encouraged everyone to be skeptical and said that, yes, we know we have a lot to prove. Actually, he said that the reason they picked video games to show off this technology was because it would be the hardest thing for them to show off. So specifically, things like um, the upload speeds, all they're sending back on the upload is controller input Controllers, yeah. and um, analytics on the line. Uh, for kind of quality of service. So that box or that software, if you're using your Mac or PC, is sending back, you know, oh, you know, in for this frame, um, somebody is something. doing something, so drop this frame way down. Yeah. Next frame, go way up. Other neat things about the service, you know, um, Russ, like you said, it's kind of like, you know, is there an Alienware sitting under this this uh, desk here that we're playing? But yeah. he said at that demo, uh, it was only 50 miles away from their server center in Santa Clara. Um, and like you said, there are server centers all over the country. They're going to have five, ultimately, uh, with a thousand mile radius around them, which will blanket pretty much the entire country. Um, but they were running at a GDC from 50 miles away, and it worked. Uh, he was saying that during those demos, you could, be, you could have been playing on up to 12 different machines or so, that it's actually able to shuffle off your game at a frame break. So you're running at, let's say, 30 frames a second or more. So at a frame break, it can move you to an entirely different system if all of a sudden you're at a scene that needs um, a lot more processing power. Interesting. So they kind of would share across the cloud, and if you walk into a level that's more graphically intensive or you have to load something, they would try and shift that off of your current machine to a different one just in a 30th of a second? Right, exactly. On a frame, And then they have software. It's, all, it's done. I mean, their big thing is the video compression, so they're able to hide it in a frame. Yeah. So, you know, as they send that video over to you, they'll start re-encoding um, on a different system. But um, it's able to share your virtual machine, if you will. It's all running virtually. Interesting stuff. I don't know, Russ, any last thoughts about online? It's, I'm yeah, still no, extremely just, skeptical, but... Yeah, I mean, me too. Just something that was interesting. I asked him specifically about um, multiplayer. And they said multiplayer actually works better here because everyone's connected to the same system. So there's really no system to system concern you're worrying about. It's really just as it's being exported. Again, you know, they're saying to H for HD you need three uh, three megabit 
uh, you know, per second connection, yeah. which yeah. I think most people are close to. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, not wild, as widely available as, you know, my connection is not that good at home. I, you know, Fios maybe, but uh, I don't think it's there all, all the way around. And yeah. again, once Time Warner and Comcast start charting up the wazoo, I don't know how people can afford this. That'll be really interesting to see. I, I mean, I think the technology in itself, like you say, Chris, if they're trying with video games first, things like video streaming on demand um, become a lot more interesting because this, if this works with video games, it could, there's a lot of other applications that will be interesting. We'll have to check it out in the summer when it comes out in beta. Guys, we're out of time. Um, thanks, Chris Grant from Joystick for joining us. It's joystick.com, of course. And uh, Russ Frushstick from UGO, thanks for joining us as well. I'm hey, Randall bro. Bennett, and uh, we'll see you next time on TechV. Thanks for joining us. TechV.com, place for everything. See ya.